Why don't y'all stand up with me and let's sing a singing song. We'll do one, two, and five. One, two, and five of 205. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In a life's ebb and flow. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Fills my Now we got it. We're gonna change something up a little bit. I forgot to tell you this at the very beginning. But on the course, on the very bottom, do you see where it says "fills my every longing"? You remember this? We're gonna put "longing in my heart." That's what I want you to sing from now on. Okay? Number two. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. This will fill my heart with pain. Swept across the broken streams, stirred the slumbering cords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing in my heart, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back. Beyond the starry sky, I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall ring with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing in my heart, keeps me singing as. Now we're going to have a foot stomper. A foot stomper. A 243. <clears throat> Y'all like this one? I heard an old, old story How a slave came from glory How he gave his life Bought me 
Hey, let's go ahead and open up in prayer tonight and let our pastor get up here for a little while. I tell you what, it's, uh, it's been a good day, I think, and uh, it's only going to get better. You know that? I, uh, I, I hate to, I mean, I don't hate to say this, but I like to say this. I think one day that uh, <clears throat> Pastor Dennis is going to be up here preaching and we're going to be out there sitting watching him, and then all of a sudden, boo, we're going to be out of here. That's going to be pretty doggone good, I think. <laughs> oh, my goodness alive. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We're ready. Okay. Hey, let's pray. Lord, thank you. Once again, you've allowed us to come back to this great place today. You've given us that want to to be here, Lord. You've given us a good day. And, uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for doing that. Lord, you're so good to us so many ways and, and uh, just giving us this opportunity to come back and worship you on this Sunday night and to sing your songs and to do the things that you want us to do, Lord, and just be obedient to you and love you and just uh, put the world behind us and, and just look to you, Lord. That's, that's the kind of stuff that, that we really do want, Lord. You know, i said it many, many times to you, Lord. I don't want nothing else but you. And uh, my goodness alive. I, I am just ready for you. <clears throat> My goodness. Lord, I love you. And I thank you for loving me. And I thank you for loving all these folks that's out here tonight, Lord. Thank you for going to that cross. Thank you for raising again that day, Lord, and showing the devil that he can't keep you down. That you're, mm, He's defeated. But, uh, so we thank you. We love you. And we ask, if you would, Lord, to be with us tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay, guys, let's come on and receive the evening offering and get right on into the rest of the service so we can move forward and look forward to maybe he'll come in the middle of the service. Boy, that'd be something. Uh, like I said before, I'd like to be in the middle of a good preaching service some of you folks sitting there about half asleep and jesus show up wow that'd be a wake-up call wouldn't it amen amen brother bill pray for us please
Thank you, Sister Jan. How many know that Sister Jan got a little happy while I go playing? <laughs> I like that, amen. I said, yeah. Um, uh, boy, I tell you what, as Christians, we're the only people in the world that can have joy when the whole world's falling apart. Because our joy is not based on what the world's doing, it's based on what Jesus is doing. And he's always in control. Uh, do remember to pray for Sister Trish Roberson. Roberson, I believe that's the way they pronounce her last name. It's Roberson or Roberson? Roberson? Okay. Uh, she's going to have surgery this Wednesday, and it sounds like a sort of uh, a skin cancer, but it's, it's scattered pretty well over her face, apparently. So remember to pray for her, hold her up to the Lord, and uh, remember that, that it could be us, and it probably will be us eventually, and continue to pray. For those who are going through difficulty, and uh, by the way, we are doing something that I that I hope will help uh, in our outside parking area. We've got several people that can that have very uh, extreme difficulty walking and getting from one place to another. Um, and today, I was watching a lady trying to get out to the vehicle, and if she was by herself, she couldn't have gotten to where she needed to get. So, what we're going to do is we're going to start. We're going to reserve a. We're going to reserve certain spaces for people as close as we can to the door for people who are in more difficult than others. So if you see a sign that says reserved and it has a number on it, don't park there unless you have that number. How's that? You can park in any other one unless you, unless you have been given a reserve. Now, if you're severe enough and, you're, and you can't walk and you feel like you need to be closer to the door than you normally get, let us know, and forever you do, if you aren't disabled, then don't park out here in our handicap area because a lot of that's made for people who can't, uh, are not as mobile as others. So uh, we just want you to know if you see that out there, and we're going to be putting a couple out there soon. So if you see that, just be sure to watch for it and not park. If there's a number there and a reserve sign, then uh, remember that is set aside for someone else. That, that probably has a great deal more. And if you want to come talk to me about your disability that's then, uh, that helps you, we'll, help, we'll to our best try to get you as close to the door as you need to be also. Does that make sense? Uh, so remember and help us pray about that. And if you have any questions about it, feel free to come, come talk to me. Uh, we'll be glad to work with you. We're in the book of John, chapter 9. What a blessing the book of John is and has been, always been to me. Because I don't believe there's any other book in the God, any other book really, that gives us the kind of d declarative statements about who Jesus is. He makes the statements over and over, I am, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am living water. All of those statements that connects him to Jehovah, I am God. And of course, through that, we can relate to this, this God within us. And not just this God around us. A lot of people think about the God around us and hardly ever think about the God in us. We even think about the God above us and still miss the God in us. By the way, we have a God that's everywhere. That means He's omniscient. Uh, it means He's omnipresent. It means He has the ability to be everywhere. He has all knowledge. And so He has all power. So knowing who this God is, let's don't treat Him like a... Uh, an absent God from our lives, and we just bump into it from time to time when we pray or when we need Him. Wherever you are, if you're a believer, that's where God is. And wherever God is, that's where you are if you're a believer. So one of the things we have to help get a grasp on is what John's doing here is declaring who Jesus is. Chapter 9 is a very informative chapter. puts the light on a lot of things, and it's all about a man being born blind. It's something that will help us understand a little bit about physical difficulties and, and answer to prayer and healing from the hand of Almighty God. And it also might answer some prayer about sin and, and, and uh, sorrows and even sickness sometimes. So as we get into chapter 9, verse 1, just stay with us as we'll look at this sixth sign, healing of the blind man. Jesus is going to be performing a miracle by recreating. Remember, this man's going to be born blind. So he's going to recreate the eyes of this man, and we'll show you that when we get to it. And uh, actually, there's four features that highlight this whole healing, if you'll go through it and just make yourself a note on it. The problem that precipitated the healing, the man was born blind. He wasn't a man that had seen before and needed rest restoring his sight. He's a man that had never had sight. 
So that was a problem that precipitated uh, the problem of the healing. And then there was a purpose for the man being born blind. By the way, how many know that there's no accidents with God? Born blind. The man was born that way. God had a purpose for this, and we'll see the purpose in that. Sometimes we have questions that are not answered, but this question is answered, why he was born blind, and the purpose for it, and then the power that healed him. How many know that God is an awesome God that has all power? I mean, there's nothing, I, remember over and over, we say this, I don't know that we always believe it, but there's nothing that God can't do. Now, there's some things that God don't do, but there's nothing that he can't do. And he doesn't always answer yes to our prayers, does he? But he does always answer them. Uh, no is an answer, or not now, or wait a later, whatever. God answers the prayer. And then the last one, actually, it was the perplexity of the people who saw the healing. They were totally perplexed. In fact, never have we ever, or will we ever, I don't believe, run into a miracle like this that so many people doubted when they could see it with their own eyes. Isn't that amazing? By the way, most people won't believe what they don't want to believe, even if they can see it with their own eyes. So we're going to see it in John chapter 9. Let's begin in verse 1. And remember, Jesus has just completed teaching the truth about the truth and the truth that frees you. So as we look at some of the truths that's found here tonight, maybe they'll help us in our understanding of our wonderful Lord. So chapter 9, verse 1. Let's read a few verses, and we'll stop and make some comments. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was blind from his birth. We need to keep that in our mind for this reason. This man had never been able to see. The eyes, if they were eyes there, uh, were not functional in the sense of having sight. He had never experienced light. He'd never experienced from any kind of vision. He didn't have anything that vision to have a problem with. So getting that in our mind to start with, this man was born this way. It had been that way since his birth. And his disciples asked him as he was passing by a question that many people ask. And they said, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, by the way, the answer the Lord gives does not infer that sin doesn't play uh, a part in sickness and sorrows. Many times, in fact, the original sin is what cast us into a body that will sin and also will suffer because of the effects of sin. But answering this question was vital so that the disciples found out that everybody that's sick is not from a particular sin that necessarily. And he'll show that here because they were asking that, a, a question that's valid. Okay, who sinned? This man or, as he asked, or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned or his parents, but the works of God, sh that the works of God should be manifest in him. Wow. Did you get that? God let him be born blind. God caused him to be born blind. Why? So that God could be glorified in this man. Do you, have you ever thought about that? God causes things and allows things so that they, in fact, God can work through and in this sickness, this illness. And by the way, if you don't believe that, go to Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, and you'll find out a whole lot. that will help you comprehend a little bit sometimes that, uh, like these guys, they asked that question. It was a valid question. And Jesus said, neither one in this particular case. Now, don't try to make this stretch over everyone that you get to. It doesn't. He said, neither in this sense. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh, now he's talking about this, as long as I'm here on earth, I have a certain things to do. I, that's my work. And that's what he called day. When the light was shining, remember, he called himself the light of this world. And he says, while I'm here, I have certain things to do. And by the way, one of the things I have to do is I have to expose you to what's about to happen to this man. You need to see the works of God in this man for your benefit. By the way, we need to pay attention. Sometimes we have our minds already set on what God does and what he doesn't do. And by the way, he never does anything that's inconsistent with Scripture. And by the way, there's no new revelation of God. It was closed when this book closed. So we have that understanding. But we don't, we don't need to try to make our Make God fit our preconceived ideas. Like these guys said, okay, somebody's seeing this guy's sick. And, of course, Jesus said no. 
That's not the case. And he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh, that's when Christ is going to leave this earth and go back to the Father, when no man can work, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, that did not mean that Jesus ceased to be the light of the world. It just meant that the light would not be manifest when he left like it was when he was here. And so, when have you ever wondered, I, I've even made the statement, boy, I would have loved to have been alive and walked with Jesus. Then I got to thinking, how stupid is that? You see, when Jesus was here, he chose to be only in one place in one, at one particular time. He limited his manifestation. Today, here's the great part. He can be with me at, the, at one time. He can be with you a million miles away at the same time. He couldn't do that when he was walking on this earth. And I thought, boy, I'll tell you what it takes. A redneck cowboy don't have any more sense than that. I know that right now is the greatest time in the world a person could have ever lived. We are blessed beyond those disciples that walk with him. You know why? Not only do we have his teaching, we have it just like they had it. Plus, we have their teachings about his teachings. Wow, they didn't have that. We have it. So who's blessed? Hallelujah, we sure are. But he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6, he says, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and he made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. You say, well, is that part of the healing ritual? No. It wasn't just healing he was fixing to do. He was fixing to recreate eyes just like he created Adam. Well, I thought about that, and I like to have a spell. I don't know. Did y'all get that? I first read that. I said, man, my goodness alive. He was just, oh, uh, y'all just excuse me. That, 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 that just primed my pump. I thought, my goodness, I'd never seen that before. Just a few weeks ago when I was studying in here, I saw that, and I said, thank you, Lord. By the way, any time God chooses to, he could still come back, spit on the ground, and make whatever he chooses. Amen? He hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he recreated that man, gave him eyes that he didn't even have so that those eyes could see. Look, let me, I better move. I'll be there for the rest of the night. He said, anointed the eyes. And that word anointed there actually infers he spread the clay upon the eyes of that blind man, preparing, as you once said, how many have, have thought, and I've said this to you a dozen times, but I'll say it again. When you, vi when you vision God in His creative works, do you envision the Father doing the work, God the Father, you know, making Adam? And How many do that? See, God the Father making Adam? It's not a trick question, but it really wasn't the Father. It was the Son. Well, John said all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Somebody say Amen. So it was the Son that was doing the creating. God, God the Father used the Son to create all things. That's why He's master over all things that were created. And by the way, there's not been any creation since He quit. Men have formed things out of what He created, but no one's created. He said, oh, have you believed? Now, there, it's like the story, and you've heard the story before about the guy that was arguing about, hey, listen, God wasn't so big. You know, we can, we can create a life being in our in now. You know, scientists can. You know, it's kind of like the old story that says, okay, go get your own dirt. It's not any except what God created. So seeing God as he is, here's what John's doing. He's pulling back the curtain a little so we can really see this magnificent Jesus as who he really is. And so he says, to this man, once he did that, he said unto him, Now go wash in the pool of Siloam. Have you wondered why he did that? The word Siloam means sent. And, of course, the pool of Siloam was uh, sometimes called the lower pool. It was, it was in, in, in history, it was, uh, um, and in the Old Testament, it was a, a very prominent place. Uh, it was a place where the washings took place at the tabernacle. Um, it was a conduit that had been made that the, that the water flowed down through, and it was used in the, in the washing in the Feast of the Tabernacle. It was a very important part. And when he told him, he said, Now, go wash in the pool of Siloam. One of the reasons is healing was always associated with cleansing. And, of course, Jesus, remember, he's even told some to go tell the priest. 
uh, that whatever and then have the priesthood. What Jesus was doing is not negating the law. He was fulfilling the law. I mentioned this morning about the law of God. The law of God has never changed. It's been fulfilled in certain areas as far as the Levitical system and the sacrificial system. Our Sabbath was completed in a person, but God never changed. How many know that God still means thou shalt not steal? He still means thou shalt not commit adultery. He still means that. The law has not been abrogated whatsoever. We're under grace. That doesn't mean the law doesn't mean, doesn't, doesn't affect. And by the way, you do know that the God, was never, God never created the law to save anybody. God created the law so he showed that nobody could save themselves. In fact, Paul said that the law was a schoolmaster teaching us that we couldn't save ourselves. That was the, he just said the law was a schoolmaster, but the poor man is. The law is teaching us. The law is held up in front of us and to say, can you be that perfect? And we have to say, no, we can't. So what can I do? I'll do it for you, and I'll save you by grace. Amen? That's what Jesus did. Do you know why it was so important that Jesus live a sinless life? He had to in order to fulfill the whole law. He did not offend the law at any point. And so he fulfilled the law because we couldn't. Why? Because we have a sinful nature and he didn't. Somebody give him a hand. Aren't you glad that it's him? Hallelujah. I How could y'all sit there and look like, y'all, come on, guys. This thing is better than peanut butter and jelly and sweeter than that, too. When you see his work, how in the world can it not just make you want to go somewhere and pray? Maybe just want to. Praise the Lord and thank Him for it. So here He is. Go to the pool of Siloam and wash, which is by interpretation sent. And He went His way, therefore, and washed and came what? Can you imagine? By the way, that even we're going to see some very important questions that go along with this thing now. Here's this guy. Jesus touches him, recreates eyes for him, sends him down to wash. Someone, I was asking one of our professors years ago well why did he need to wash his face he said you ever had clay on your face <laughs> pretty good answer or wash the clay off so anyway as it continued he says this to him watch this he went his way therefore and washed and came seeing the neighbors therefore and they which before had seen him that he was blind says is not this he that sat and begged this guy was so different, even his neighbors wondered if it was really him. You know, I read that and I thought, boy, that's the way every one of us would get saved or be. Is that really that old boy that used to do this, that, and the other? Was that guy blind? And by the way, we were blind spiritually until he opened our eyes. And now they ought to look around and say, oh, you mean that's, that's him? Well, by the way, they weren't sure because look at the next verse in verse 9. Some said, this is he? Oh, yeah, that's him. I remember seeing him. And others said, oh, well, he's just like him. But he said, I like this, I am he. By the way, sometimes you need to validate the fact that one day you were blind and now you see. Are you the same person? No, I'm a new person, but I'm still me. Does that make sense? I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. And he said, no, I'm, I'm the one. I'm the one that sat at the gate and begged. And by the way, you were relegated at that point in time when you couldn't see or you were disabled to the point that you weren't able to make a living. Your only opportunity to survive was to sit at the gate and beg. And this guy wasn't doing something just because he was too sorry to work or whatever. It was, he was disabled. And, of course, they qualified beggars back in those days. Is that they had to be disabled in order to be at the gate begging. <laughs> Verse 10 said, Therefore said they unto him, Well, if you are the guy who was blind, how were your eyes opened? Tell us. How was your eyes opened? Boy, let me tell you what. Have you ever had somebody to ask you, well, what changed your life? Well, it wasn't a what. It was a who, amen, that changed your life. What an opportunity to share the gospel. And this guy doesn't necessarily at this point in time comprehend and understand who this man was but anyway he's he, he answered and said a man that is called jesus and i love the way he said made clay it almost sounds like he didn't just use clay he did y'all read it too he made it i can't get this in my little peanut brain so y'all stay with me on it i i do don't know how it happened i do know that the text itself said this man said it. Now, how could he know that because he couldn't see at the time? 
but you can feel it, right? So he said, He made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Well, where is he? And he said, I, I don't know. I know not. Now, can you wonder why they're wanting to find? Wait a minute. There's a little catch that we'll get to in just a minute. Let me go ahead and give you an advance notice. This is the Sabbath day. Jesus has been in trouble since chapter 5 for doing one act of healing a man on the day of, on the Sabbath. Here it, Jesus just don't learn, does he? What a statement. What a st he doesn't need to learn. He knows it all. He's got it all under control. And so he said, um, they brought and said, I know not. I don't know where he's at. And they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. Now, you see, here's what they're saying. We better go tell this to the big shots up there because we know how they feel about anybody doing anything on the Sabbath that they're not supposed to do. It was okay to, uh, to do a lot of things on the Sabbath, but it was okay if the Pharisees did it. It wasn't okay if you did it and you weren't one of the group. And the Bible says, and it was the Sabbath day. There it is. When Jesus made the clay, and there's the word again, made, and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received this sight. By the way, if you'll go through this thing, I think he was asked about 15 times, how did this really happen? How did, when did they ever get the point? It's like I told you, no matter how many times you sell somebody the truth, if they don't want to believe it, you just got to keep saying it, keep saying it, keep saying it. How, how he'd received his sight, he said unto them, he put clay upon my eyes and I washed and do see. It's kind of like this guy's ready to see, what don't you get about what I said? Verse 16, therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God. <laughs> no, he's not of God. He is God. Because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, uh, I, you know, you want to interject your own thoughts. He don't have to keep the Sabbath day. He is the Sabbath day. He is the rest of God. And others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? They were kind of, you know, bumfuddled about this thing. You, you keep saying this man is breaking the law of God and not keeping the Sabbath. How can a sinner, a man that's, that's not a godly man, do such miracle, and there was a division among them. Always a division over truth and error, are they not? By the way, you do know what most people consider truth is what they believe, whether it's truth or not. That's what they were holding on to. Can't do anything like that. He did this on the Sabbath. In verse 17, and by the way, Jesus wasn't belittling the Sabbath whatsoever. He was hoping to teach these people that the Sabbath wasn't just wasn't a day. It was an event. It was, it was the rest that was going to be created in Christ Jesus, fulfilling the Sabbath. And uh, <clears throat> verse 17, they said unto the blind man, again, What sayest thou of him that he, hath, that he hath opened thine eyes? And he said, this man answered and said, Well, I get the idea this man's a prophet. Of course, we're in John chapter 10, verse 17, where he said that. And he says, he is a prophet. And so being a prophet, is, as in that word, would just really bother them because one just called him a sinner. Now, you can't be both. You can't be a prophet and a sinner. Somebody's got to make up their mind eventually what they're going to believe about him. And <coughs> so, and they said, well, uh, he's a prophet. Verse 18 said, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. What you got to do to prove something to some people? There he is, standing right in front of them. He sees now. They knew he begged at the streets. They said, I tell you what, this guy may not have been born blind. He may be just putting on a sound. Call his parents. Call mom and daddy down here. We'll get this thing settled. Mom and daddy will tell us if he actually was born blind. <laughs> in verse 19, and they asked them, saying, they came, saying, is this your son? whom you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. Is that the answer you want? But by what means he now seeth, we don't know. He left the house blind and he came home seeing. We don't know. 
Or who hath opened his eyes? We know not. By the way, he's of age. Why don't you let him speak for himself? And that was the problem. He already spoke for himself. They wanted somebody to agree with them that this man could. This gets kind of ridiculous. You see how ridiculous people are that want to prove a point and will overlook the obvious just to continue to believe what they believe. Isn't that something? Wonderful illustration. So we see, verse 22, These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. They, did, they, didn't, they were in power. The Jews were in power. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were in power. They literally held people's spiritual lives in their hands, and they knew that they could kick them out of the, out of the, out of the temple. In fact, it'll say here, they feared the Jews, for the Jews had, all, had agreed already that if any man did confess that he, Jesus, was Christ, that person should be put out of the what? Synagogue. Put out of the synagogue. Do you understand what that means to them? Literally, they were absolutely segregated from the possibility of the atonement. Redemption. No redemption except through the synagogue under the Jewish law. So they understood that if we say the wrong thing, we're in trouble. They feared the Jews. Then the Bible says, verse 23, Therefore said his parents, He is of age, ask him. Then, again, called they the man. How many times this poor guy has got... By the way, this guy's got a real sense of humor. Watch him just in a few minutes. And they, the man that was blind, and they said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. <laughs> they Double-minded. Double he answered and said... Now, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know for sure, though, buddy, whereas I was blind, now I see. Don't you just love that? He said, I, don't, I may not know the answer to all your theological questions. I may not be able to say them and ask them, but I know this much. I came home from home this morning. I had to be led to the corner so I could sit down and beg. But I'm walking today, and I see, and I will go home tonight. And I don't even, I've never seen the road to home, but I'll bet you I can find it. I don't know how. Have you ever tried to tell somebody you knew how you were saved? Of course, you, sometimes you just have to say, I don't know all about how God worked out salvation but this one thing I know, I was lost and now I'm found. Isn't that a good enough answer? I know what the Word says and I can tell you that, but I know absolutely that I was blind and now I see. Um, wow. And then he says this. I was looking at where I was trying. Where am I? I get too excited and don't know where I am in the Word. <laughs> so anyway, y'all, thank you for helping me find it. In verse 27, he answered them and said, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Boy, how many times has he told them? Over and over and over. He said, you didn't hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will you also? And I love this. You want to be his disciples? <laughs> Can you hear him right now? I love the way this guy did that, though. Hey, I've told you over and over. Why, you want to be his disciples? And boy, that really set him on fire. And it's, <laughs> oh, and verse 28, and said, Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. Well, you know, I don't remember anywhere that Moses gave a man sight. Do you? As great a man as Moses was. Um, this man's different in every sense of the word. Moses is a great man of God. God used him greatly. But the Bible says in verse 29, We know that God spake unto Moses, as far as this fellow, we don't know where he came from or where he is. The man answered and said unto him, unto them, Why herein is it a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he's opened my eyes. This guy says, Hey, I don't get it. What's so important to you about where he came from or where he is? What's important to me is I can see. The miracle has worked. Now, we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, 
He could do what? Nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? Now they really got on this. You're trying to teach us. You don't know. We got an A, B, C, D, E, F, G behind our name. I mean, we, we hold credentials in our religious, religious authority here. Uh, and you're going to teach us? Well, boy, I tell you what, he's done a pretty good job of it so far. Amen. But they still don't have the answer they're looking for. And dost thou teach us? And guess what? By the way, I looked this up, and this is the first man ever cast out of the synagogue for following Jesus Christ. What a wonderful way to get kicked out of church. And by the way, it's almost got that bad now. If you really want to, want to believe everything that the Word of God says and believe it the way it was said, people think it's a little bit strange. Well, I like to be strange, wouldn't you? So he says, just treat me the way you want to, but cast me out. Jesus heard about it, by the way. There's nothing said that he doesn't hear about. And I love that when he said Jesus heard that they had cast him out. You know what he was waiting for? Jesus was waiting for him to get out of church so he could give him out of, out of the synagogue so he could give him something better than the synagogue. It's called eternal life. Cast him out. They heard that in Jesus. And when he had found him, he says in verse 35, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Well, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? You know what he's saying? I want to believe on him, but I, I don't know who he is. We don't, how, you don't know who he is until he introduces himself to you, ladies and gentlemen. No matter who you are, he does the introducing. And so, and Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Now, right about here, I would have lost it. You're talking to the Son of God. And by the way, where's all the religious people with all their theology? They're still trying to figure out what in the world went on. And this man is out here talking with the Son of God. That just makes me want to have a running spell. Amen. That does me good. And then the Bible says in verse 38, And he said, the minute he was introduced to the Son of God by the Son of God, he said, I believe. <laughs> and he worshipped him. Two beautiful things that happen always happen when you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You are the only one that could have the opportunity and the right to worship him because now he's your Lord. Amen. And then he said, verse 39, Jesus is closing the segment. For judgment I am coming to this world that they which see not might see and that they which see might be made blind. Here's the play on words. I came and you were blind. I came and they thought they saw. I'm leaving and you're the only one in the bunch that can see. The others are still blind. They're blinded by their own desires to be and stay with what they've been taught rather than believing me, the truth of the Son of God. Well, I've got to say something to you folks. Listen to me carefully. No matter what the world says, no matter what the religious authorities say, you better make sure that you cling tightly to the Word of God because that's the revelation of who He is. And John says, And some of the Pharisees which were with Him heard these words and said unto Him, Oh, almost like an oh, are we blind? Are we blind also? And listen to the way Jesus answered. If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. You know what he said? If you were blind like this man was and chose to believe even what you couldn't see, then I could help you see. But you choose to think you see, I'm going to leave you blind. Wow. I want to say something to you tonight. Hold on to this thought. Jesus came to the halt, the blind, the lame. Why? Because God was working through the... Remember that at the beginning of the story when they asked him about, well, who sinned, him or his, uh, or his parents? Who sinned? And Jesus answered them and said, this is for the glory of God. Now you see what he meant. God allowed this man to be born without eyes so that we today and those there 
And the blind man walked away, walked away not just seeing, he walked away with spiritual vision that the others didn't have. He saw the Son of God, and they didn't see him in all of that. He was right in the middle of him, and they missed him. I wonder how many times that happens in church. Jesus is right in the middle of them, and we're so busy with doing our little thing or whatever it is. You know, we got to have, you know, we got to have three songs and a and of this, and then we got to have 30, 34 and a half minutes of this and five minutes of this. God's going to show up one day, and we're going to be so happy we're just going to hang from the ceiling, <laughs> and it won't matter how long we're here. Amen. And I don't believe just being here long makes any difference. I think being here right is what makes a difference. So God is looking to move today in His church. And he, His people have got, you know what we need to do? God knows we need to get blind to the world. He was blind to the world, but He had His eyes open to Jesus. Just get blind to the world. Walk, walk away seeing and then have Him say, Okay, you see, you walk with me. The others can't see. They're stumbling around in the blind. And, the, and it's a sad day because you do know that he offered himself to all the present there, even the religious people. He offered himself to them, but they chose to hold on to their religion and lose their soul. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Uh, great lesson. Would you not say that amen? What a wonderful illustration of how God works, and, and we need to keep our eyes on what Jesus is doing and not get our eyes on what other people are doing. And all of this hubbaloo about asking people, uh, how many times was he asked? I didn't count, but it's more than I would expect anybody with any sense to ask. You would think they would have got the answer somewhere, but they did get the answer at the end. Those that think they see are the ones that's really blind. They're the ones that think they're really blind. So anybody have a question? Hold on tight. Walk out of here with your spiritual eyes wide open. And usually if your spiritual eyes are open, you'll run into a few things on the way out. Because when you can see in the Spirit, it don't matter what you hit, you're okay. You're good, you're good to go. I pray you'll have a great week. Look for God to show up every day. And by the way, if you don't look for Him to show up, He won't. He shows up by faith. You're believing and Him responding. All right, then let's, yes, ma'am. Don't forget that. Here goes Jamie back on parade again. Every year she's up and ready to go. Don't forget if you know kids that don't have uh, clothes or, or maybe a family and they're get, trying to get ready to get back in school and everything, be sure to let Jamie know and she'll be glad to get it. I love the term she used there, clothes that are gently used. That means they're wearable, right, sweetie? Amen. So let's pray for Jamie as she goes about to, to do the work that, that God, God's given her. Amen. All right, Brother Leonard Haney, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?